so our final talk of the session will be given by Peter Humphreys, and he's going to be talking about quantum networks, diamond spins for computing and communication. Uh, well, thanks for sticking with me to the end of this uh, extremely enjoyable conference, and uh, thank you to the organisers for inviting me. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Peter Humphreys, and I'm a postdoc in Ronald Hansen's group at TU Delft. And I want to talk to you today about some of our work on quantum networks uh, using diamond spins. So, I guess we've already had a few talks today where we sort of the, the, the ideas of a quantum internet have been motivated. I mean, uh, a quantum internet will enable uh, quantum communication so we can distribute states, device independent key distribution, as well as quantum enhanced metrology and sort of blind quantum computing. And so it's an important goal to pursue, and it's something that we're pursuing quite hard at Delft. Um, and so our ambition over the next few years is to build a tens of kilometer scale quantum internet using several nodes. And we're doing that by drawing on a diverse team of experimental physicists, as well as theorists, material scientists, and engineering support. And um, our vision is to use the, the Nitrogen Vacancy Center that Jason has already introduced a bit. Uh, and the reason for that is that it has several key useful properties for quantum networks. So the first thing is that it has a, a nice, bright optical interface that we can use both to prepare the state of the spin qubit by pump optical pumping, as well as to carry out high fidelity single shot readouts, so we can achieve single shot readouts in the moment on the order of 96%. So this allows us to both prepare and measure our state of our spin qubit. And in addition, the spin qubit itself at cryogenic temperatures has very long coherence times under dynamical decoupling, so we can achieve coherence times up to the order of a second. Uh, with appropriate dynamical decoupling sequences. But the nice thing about the Nitrogen Vacancy Center uh, as a system is you don't just get the spin qubit of the Nitrogen Vacancy Center because Diamond naturally plays host to carbon-13 spins nearby and these will couple to your Nitrogen Vacancy Center. We can actually indirectly control these spins using the Nitrogen Vacancy Center and so in essence for free we get a set of uh, quantum memories that are quite robust nearby. And finally, um, one nice thing about the Nitrogen Vacancy Center is that as well as being able to prepare and measure the state using this optical interface, we can also uh, create entanglement between distant Nitrogen Vacancy Centers uh, using similar methods. And so this is something that I want to dwell on a bit more today. So uh, just bringing all of those ingredients together, our, um, our vision is to have uh, a quantum network that's built up of these different nodes, each of which has a Nitrogen Vacancy Center. And so the Nitrogen Vacancy Center will act as our communication qubit, so we can use it to entangle different nodes. And then we also have these memory qubits nearby that we can store quantum information in. And of course we can use the Nitrogen Vacancy Center to control these spins and do error correction and local processing. And finally, we also want to inc incorporate uh, frequency conversion to convert the emission of the Nitrogen Vacancy Center to telecom wavelengths to really push the distance over which this can be achieved. And so, um, Jason just gave a really nice talk about his optical microcavity. Uh, we are pursuing a similar um, system in Delft, uh, also with a membrane. And so, there's been some other really nice work that was on the archive, I think last month, uh, by the Basel group. And they actually saw almost 50% of the light emitted into the zero phone online. Um, again, uh, not quite at the level of line width that you need for this entanglement generation, but showing that this is something that's very achievable. And also, we're pursuing this wavelength conversion in our lab. Um, but today, as I said, I want to focus on our efforts to, to really push forward the network protocol, so to discuss how we want to wire up this future quantum internet. Um, and then, sort of linking on from this, I will talk a bit about our work on entanglement distillation between remote nodes. All right. So, how would you wire up the quantum internet using MVs in an ideal way? So, let's just imagine we have a perfect system well, what would you do? Well, as I mentioned, we have this optical interface and it's spin selective. So only if the nitrogen vacancy is in one state can it be excited up to an excited state and then it will emit a photon by spontaneous emission. Whereas if it's in this other state, then it will remain dark. And so uh, here, these states are sort of a bit badly labeled. Uh, typically, so this, this state, this bright state, is the MS equals zero state. And we just pick one of the MS equals plus minus one states to be our other state. So we make a qubit out of our nitrogen vacancy center. And so what we can do uh, by applying resonant ex excitation when the NV is in a superposition state is we can create an entangled state between the NV 
and the state of an electromagnetic mode. And so I've said photon here, that's not quite accurate. What I mean is the presence or absence of a photon. And so we can do that on one side. So now we have spin photon entanglement. And we can also do it on the other side. And so we have this product state of these two spin photon entangled pairs. And so now we can collect the photon and send it to a central beam splitter station. Uh, this is sort of talking very similarly to the stuff that Sven was discussing earlier briefly. Um, and if we get a click, and only one click in this ideal case, then we know that, well, one of the MVs had to be in the bright state, whereas the other one was in the dark state. But we don't know which one because of this beam splitter. And so this click projects us into an entangled state. So this sounds great, but obviously this isn't what people do. Uh, and the reason is that in any real system, you have significant imperfections. So in particular for us, we have optical losses, and we don't stabilize this optical path length. So there's an unknown phase that your state acquires. And so <coughs> instead of getting a nice entangled state, what we actually get is an entangled state that has an unknown phase, already used this. And even furthermore, we have this admixture with this mixed state, because in the limit of large losses, well, if you get a click, so you know one of the MVs was in the bright state, but actually it's equally likely that instead of the other one being in the dark state, it might have also just been in the bright state and you've lost the photon. So this seems pretty useless, right? Um, and so the question is, well, how do you overcome this? And so to date, what we've done and others have done is a two-photon style of protocol. And so what we do here is we start in the same way that I just described. And so we have this single click and we have this useless state. But then what we can do is we can flip the state of the NVs locally. So now if they were in zero, they're in one and vice versa. And so in this case, well, this, this add part of the admixture, the bit that we like, is still an entangled state. Uh, whereas this mixed state has gone from being zero, zero to being one, one. And so now if we excite again, well, if it was in this ad part of the admixture, it can still emit a photon because one of them is in one and the other one's in zero. Whereas here, this is now both of the NVs are in a dark state, so you'll never get a photon out. And so it turns out that conditional getting that second click, you can remove this part of the, uh, the admixture, and also it turns out that you remove your phase dependence. So that sounds great, but of course, the, the significant cost is that now you have to get two clicks, and so your success probability scales with transmission squared. And for us, because of the zero phone online that uh, Jason talked about, as well as uh, just due, due to our finite collection efficiencies, our transmission is on the order of 10 to the minus three, and so that means that only one in 10 to the minus six uh, of our attempts do we actually successfully produce entanglement. And so for the long distance entanglement over 1.3 kilometers, that was about one click every two hours. Uh, if they're beside each other, you're not gonna do much better than one every 50 seconds, which is pretty useless for building quantum networks. So this is, I mean, this helps it solve the problem, but it's not really good enough to go forwards. So the question is, how can we do better? So, to explain this, uh, I need to draw an analogy with beer, but not good beer, uh, specifically Bud Light or some similar other American terrible beer like you might have in a conference in America. And the trouble with something like Bud Light is it doesn't matter how much of it I have, I still don't want to drink it, right? I can have crates and crates of Bud Light, but I'm, I'm not going to have any fun, I'm not going to drink it. And so, well, what do I do? I'm an enterprising physicist, and I know about distillation. And I know that, okay, it may not be great, but at least I can take this Bud Light, as much as I can get hold of, and I can stick it in a distillation apparatus, and I can make something that at least tastes or something. And so, in this way, I've taken something that I thought was useless, because you know, each of these states is useless, I can't, I can't drink it, but I've ended up with something that's ultimately useful to me. And so, okay, in quantum, we just whack entanglement on, on the front, and we have entanglement distillation, and we can do the same thing. So, what we do is, okay, instead of producing one state, we make two terrible states, and then actually it turns out remarkably, just by local processing and classical communication, you can go from two imperfect states to a, a higher quality um, entangled state. Uh, and so the, the, the catch is that this is probabilistic, you know, this particular scheme only succeeds about an eighth of the time, uh, and also of course you've got to produce two states. But the, the nice thing about it is not only do you produce a higher quality state, but you've broken this uh, eta squared scaling because now, so you can, you have, instead of having to get two clicks at once, what you can do is produce one state and get a single click and try lots of times and then store that. And then you can try lots of times again to make your second state. So now that instead of scaling with eta squared, sorry, eta squared, uh, the success rate scales closer to being linear. And so you have a high quality state, but you can also produce it quickly. And so this is a, 
this particular scheme is uh, sort of the extreme photon loss scheme, and that kind of comes from Simon Benjamin and L. Campbell in this paper here. Unfortunately, it turns out this is pretty hard. Um, so, so far, in terms of experiments, there have been photon photonic experiments by Jiang Wei-Pan, uh, but there, that was post-selected, and because you, to, to tell whether you succeeded, you had to measure your state, and so it wasn't available to do anything else with. And also, there's been uh, an experiment with uh, local nodes within one track, but, I mean, that's not the sort of the network setting in which this protocol was envisaged. And the reason that this is tricky is that you need two things at once. You need to be able to generate entanglement, but you also have to be able to reliably store a state because you have to generate one and then the next state. And this is a challenging uh, combination to combine. So um, it happens that for other systems it's also tricky, but I'm going to talk specifically about why for NVs this is tricky. Um, and that's because, so we have this coupling for free between our nitrogen vacancy center and the nearby nuclear spin, but we can't turn that off. And so that means when we're doing our remote entanglement generation, the state of our carbon spin, where we stored our state, is sensitive to the state of the NV. Um, so specifically, because this NV is acting like a bit of a bar magnet, it locally changes the magnetic field that the nuclear spin experiences, so it processes around a different axis. So why is this a problem? Well, the problem is that, okay, so when we do our entanglement generation, what we do is we use microwave pulses to prepare our NV in a superposition state, and then we optically excite. And so we don't know, I mean, if this fails, the nitrogen vacancy center is now going to be in a mixed state. We don't know if it was in zero or one. And so it means that the, this will, your nuclear spin will pick up a different phase depending on which state the nitrogen vacancy was in. And so, okay, so here you see that I've, I've said that we pick up a phase in this, this state of the nuclear spin, and so the phase depends on whether the nitrogen vacancy happened to be in zero or one. Well, we can solve that a little bit, uh, well, a long way actually, by applying a pi pulse. So now, okay, we don't know if it was in zero to begin with or one, but we can flip it, and so if you do that carefully with your timing, you can sort of average it out so that it spends the same time in zero as it would in one. So you might think, okay, well, we solved that. But there are two problems still. So the first is that, okay, well, we balance the phase, but it's still picking up a phase, and because we don't know exactly which of our entanglement generation attempts is going to succeed, that means that we have to on the fly correct for this phase evolution. So there's a deterministic phase. And then the other more subtle problem is that, so we have to reinitialize our spin uh, by repumping before we carry out entanglement generation. And this is a stochastic process, so we don't know exactly when we're going to succeed. And so this means that we don't know exactly how long it spends in the zero state, and so we, that means that it picks up a slight small amount of phase that we can't compensate for. So. Um, just looking at the first problem of this deterministic phase evolution, so we can apply our entanglement generation sequence, um, and what we, all we have to do really is we have a microprocessor and we just count the number of times that we do this until it succeeds. And then what we can do is once this has happened, we can just apply a decoupling sequence to our nitrogen vacancy spin, so it's microwaves, and we just have to engineer it from pre-calibration so that the number of, well, the phase is picked up here, which is n times the phase you get per sequence, needs to be cancelled by the phase you pick up in this. And so we showed that we could do that on the fly. So uh, if we don't do this compensation, you get these oscillations uh, when you measure, prepare your nuclear spin in a superposition state and then you measure it. Uh, whereas when we do the, this compensation using a microprocessor, well, by changing m suitably to compensate for n, we're always able to uh, remain with high fidelity in the, in the plus state. The other um, uh, part of the problem is more tricky because there's no way we can stop. We need to repump the state, we need to reinitialize, so there's no way we can get away from this dephasing. Um, and so you can see that if we scan the number of entangling attempts and we prepare different states in the block sphere of our nuclear spin, then you get dephasing. So the eigenstates stay pretty decently high, but states on the equator um, dephase. But what we can do is that we can pick carbons that have different coupling strengths to our NV. And so as we increase the coupling strength, of course, it becomes more controllable. Um, but then also the state gets wiped out quicker under this entanglement generation. And so we can trade off, we can choose a carbon that has a coupling strength that remains controllable, but allows us to, say, have hundreds, hundreds of entanglement generation attempts before we do. 
So having solved that problem, this key problem of combining uh, entanglement generation with uh, quantum memories, uh, we're able to move forward to this distillation experiment. And so this is uh, recently published well, on the archive about a month ago. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we did. So um, the concept of the protocol uh, is as follows. So as I said before, we first of all have to generate a remote entangled state. And we did this uh, between two NDs in separate cryostats separated by two meters. And then once we succeed, we swap the state from the nitrogen vacancy centers where we created the entangled state onto the nuclear spins nearby. This then frees up the nitrogen vacancy center so that we can then attempt again to produce an entangled state using this uh, remote entanglement generation protocol, single click. And then we can carry out distillation via local operations, so using this coupling to carry out two qubit gates. Um, and so in reality, of course, there's a, a gate sequence involved with that. And uh, this is a bit what the setup looks like. So we have the NV uh, in cryostats, and we have different lasers for uh, preparing the state and carrying out readout. Uh, and then we have a fiber network to combine the emission from the NVs, the zero phone online emission, on a beam splitter. And we can use that to herald entanglement. And um, we don't have a micro cavity, so our, our NVs have a, a solid immersion lens over the top to enhance the collection efficiency. It's on the order of about 10%. All right, so how well did we do? Um, so the first thing we want to look at is, okay, well, we want to generate this first entangled state. But one problem we have is, of course, that the whole problem which we set out to solve uh, is that, well, we have this mix of this, but also we're not phase stabilizing this link. And so this means that under single-click entanglement generation, the, uh, the phase of our state is unknown to us and will wash out. And so if we look at the state fidelity of this initial state uh, to a Bell state, well, we, can only, we only get the, the populations, the correlations, but not the coherences. And so if we measure the state fidelity, we find that it's always below 0.5. So as far as we're concerned, this state is not entangled. It's not excessively entangled to us because it's a single-click entanglement generation protocol. And so what I plotted here is the state fidelity, and actually what we're doing is we're sweeping the angle of our initial NV superposition state. Um, and you might say, okay, well, why would you do that? Well, the reason is that by doing this, you can actually reduce the probability that your state is, will produce a photon to begin with. And so in that way, you can squash down the mixed state components of the bad part and increase this, but at the cost that your, as I'll show later, um, your, your rate of entanglement generation goes down. So by playing with this angle, we can increase the fidelity of the state, or we can go faster. So as I mentioned, we don't have access to um, the, the, the full coherences of this state, but we can independently measure the visibility of the two-photon quantum interference, and we know the dark counts, and so we can upper bound what the fidelity could possibly be uh, using these independently measured parameters. And so that's this curve that I plotted here. So we've taken the measured populations, and we use the other independently measured information, and we can say that the state that we start with here is at best along this line. So now we swap it onto the memories, and this is not a perfect operation. As I mentioned, there's um, decoherence uh, due to entanglement generation, and so uh, once we swap this state in, then it now lies closer to being along this line here, and there's some can't quite see there's a shaded area depending on how many entanglement generation attempts we take. And so this means after we've generated the second entangled state, which is going to have the same fidelity, we now have these two states represented by these two lines here. So these are now the resource states for our entanglement distillation. These represent the beers, as it were. And so the question is, well, did we can we succeed? Can we make something that's higher fidelity than both of these states? And it turns out the answer is, well, yes, we can. So this is the measured data, this measured state fidelity for our final state. And you see that the, this state fidelity is higher than both of these entangled states. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, by scanning the angle, we can change the, the fidelity of the state. So initially, if we push this angle down, then we can produce a higher fidelity state because we can squash this mixed state component. Uh, but there's a cost in terms of the rate. So you see that the initially, so here this is the EBIT rate, so it's a measure of uh, both the entanglement, qual the quality of the entanglement and the rate we can deliver it. And you see initially we can, as we go this way, the EBIT rate goes up because the fidelity of the entanglement <coughs> increases. Uh, but then here, because the 
the probability of succeeding goes down, it means that the e-vote rate goes back down again. And so this line here, the orange line, is the best you could ever do uh, using our system at a Barrett and Cox style two photon protocol. And so you see that we, we, uh, we are significantly above that line. We're doing better than you could ever do, even with the overhead of the time taken for doing these swaps and the local operations. So, in summary, a little ahead of schedule, um, Nigerian Vacancy Centers and Diamond are promising nodes for quantum networks. Uh, and uh, the key, a key protocol for achieving this is entanglement distillation because it allows us to overcome inevitable sources of decoherence in these quantum networks. And this is enabled by combining fast single click entanglement generation with our ability to carry up robust storage. And this showed us, allowed us to show that we could create a boost to EBIT rates over the best you could ever do using a two photon protocol. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the people who were involved. So in particular, Norbert Kalb and Andreas Reiser, who's now gone back to MPQ in Munich, uh, worked very closely um, on this experiment. Uh, in addition, we had theory work from uh, Naomi Nickerson and Simon Benjamin at Oxford. And then um, Element 6 gave us uh, the samples that we used. So uh, thank you. That's a very good question. So I, I, I have to admit that the, so that was a, a hero experiment over one kilometer, right? And so you have the additional losses in fiber there. Um, so our, our rate, so this is, if you took the, our setups and you did the same thing, that, this is where you'd lie. So we're not, we're not winning a lot with this protocol at the moment. So you're, you're sitting at about one per 20 seconds if you were to use our setups as it stands and do a two photon quantum, like a two photon protocol. Um, and so you can see that maybe we, we, we've doubled the rate that we can achieve. Um, and of course this is because um, there's a, an overhead to the time required to carry this out. Uh, also this is a, I guess it, this isn't quite right because this is an EBIT rate uh, and the, the quality of the states you generate here are much better than, the, are better than the states that we can currently generate. But we can really push that up uh, because currently we're just limited mostly by uh, not so much the decoherence in these memories, but uh, actually the, the T2 time, because we, have, we picked a memory that didn't have a particularly good T2 time and microwave pulse errors. And both of these things we can, in a future experiment, really push up. So we can definitely push up the fidelities. Of course, to, to really get the rates a lot higher, we have to do what Jason's doing, which is what we're doing. Right? We have to have the zero phone online enhancement. Uh, and we're fairly confident that in the next few months we should be able to see first results from that. Um, great talk, and this is uh, also uh, really cool results. Uh, so my, my question probably is a stupid one. Uh, in in these sort of two photon protocol, um, I think I'm right in saying it doesn't. Uh, the the Baron Cox scheme, you can wait. You, you wait for your first click, then you do your pi pulse, then you wait for your second click. But you can also not bother with that and just excite twice and wait to get one click, right? So the time ordering of your detection doesn't matter with respect to your excitation. Yeah. So, yes, so, so I, I was, I was uh, this, was, this was for pedagogical purposes that I expected in this way. We don't wait for that first click. Uh, but it, it is, I think it's more helpful to think about this protocol as a two-step protocol. Even yeah, sure, but, okay, but in fact, you do just, you just do the whole muzzle and then you just yeah. wait for the events where there was a click. Yes, so, I mean, there's uh, about, uh, 200 mic uh, nanoseconds between the two. Okay. And therefore, it doesn't matter how far apart they are. Yeah, but the point is they have to be sequential. That's the key. The, the two clicks have to come in the same experiment, as opposed to being able to try once, uh, lots of times to get the first click, store it, and then try lots of times to get the second click. And that's the, the advantage, the principle of this, this scheme. Jason, question. Yeah. Um, so I think you might have answered this question previously. So apologies if so. Um, 
can you do a third round? Can you add a third beer, third beer bottle to your yeah. big experiment and get it even higher? Um, so I, I, yes, of course. In principle, we have carbons nearby. Yeah. Um, they're they're, con they're controllable. Um, I think that for, to do that, I we would have to increase the complexity of the experiment a little bit. So the first thing I'd want to implement is um, do a, an echo on the nuclear spins because I mean, the, the, in principle, the T two can be much longer than it is because it's just the sort of the raw T two. Um, so it's some more experimental complexity in terms of sort of the, the, the classical control that we'd have to implement to be able to do that. But I think in the, apart from that, there's no reason that we couldn't do that. Yeah. Any more questions about the experiment? Yeah, I so for your entanglement uh, purification, do you need some thresholds to start with the, the massive chemical step? Sorry, could you just repeat that? Uh, to, so to start your entanglement destination, mm -hmm. so is there any the minimum entanglement identity you need to start with? Yeah, so um, we, uh, I didn't present the, the data here, but uh, so this, this data is um, assuming that it's succeeded in the first 50 uh, mm -hmm. attempts. And we actually run the experiment out to a few hundred attempts. So att attempts to do the first entanglement generation and then attempts to do the second one. And the reason that we stop there is because the, the state has degraded to the point where there's no point in doing entanglement distillation. Um, so we, 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 we know beforehand how far we can push the experiment and still be able to do something useful. If that's not the case, I'd like to thank Peter and all the talks um, in the afternoon session.